uh, here's what the book looks like, and it's uh, it's available at the bargain price of twenty nine ninety five from the Cambridge University Press. But I'll tell you, it's actually available cheaper from Amazon.com. But <laughs> on, on, a ser on a serious note, uh, I want to be quick to acknowledge that this book is co-authored with uh, Evelyn Ash and Jeffrey Ballou. And Evelyn Ash is right here. Evelyn, thanks very much for all of your wonderful involvement in all this. Uh, Bruce, in the introduction, mentioned my long interest in uh, nonprofit organizations, uh, which is, is accurate. Uh, I also, though, want to expand a bit on this to say that nonprofit organizations do not exist uh, in a vacuum. Uh, and in fact, what the interest in nonprofits you know, led to was a recognition of and an interest in uh, what we might call mixed industries, in which you have nonprofit organizations that coexist with and compete with frequently for profit organizations and also public organizations. And that's certainly true of the higher education industry. Uh, it's also true of the hospital industry, uh, nursing homes. Uh, arguably, it's also true of you know, mu museums, uh, anti poverty programs. There are all sorts of industries that are mixed in which the, the organizational structure uh, of the industry uh, ought to reflect uh, advantages and disadvantages of different organizational structures. So that's a, a bit of, uh, of background. Now, if, turning to the, the general subject of the book on uh, mission and money, uh, understanding the university, you know, I really start with this with an observation that uh, uh, Half of the entire population of the United States uh, has been to college. They have not necessarily graduated, but they've been to college. Uh, but I, I would assert that even those roughly half of the half that graduated know very little about what goes on at a university. Sure, they know there are courses. They may know that there are uh, sports, but they really know extremely little about what this kind of organization uh, really involves and how it ticks, how does it respond, how, how does it, or my guess is they don't even think about whether it, uh, it, it competes. But let me, in this introductory uh, phase, just point out a few uh, statistics to you. One is one that I always find, uh, despite having known about it for some time, uh, kind of dramatic. How many colleges do you think there are in the country? 4,300, of which well over 2,000, actually about 2,600, uh, are baccalaureate degree granting institutions as four-year schools. 2,600. I don't know if you've ever had an occasion, I suggest if you want some amusement sometime, uh, there are lists of these schools available. Take a look. And my personal experience is that the vast majority of these schools I have literally never heard of in any context. But they're out there, and they are part of a system, and they are competing, and they are doing things, uh, and we can't really understand what's going on with respect to higher education unless we uh, take them into account. It's also true, as I, in effect, said a moment ago, that these schools combine uh, nonprofit schools, which Northwestern is one. These are what are typically called private, but the fact is they're not just private, they're private and nonprofit. Of course, there are lots of public colleges and universities, but there is also a small but rapidly growing private for profit sector, topped, of course, by the University of Phoenix, but it turns out that there are something like a dozen. Uh, for-profit higher education schools that are large enough to be publicly traded on organized stock exchanges. Uh, the University of Phoenix, as the kind of uh, a leader in this industry, has, and it's a good thing you're sitting down, this might shock you, 300,000 students, which makes it far, far away the biggest 
uh, higher education institution in the country, uh, and over 200 campuses scattered around the country. Uh, we could talk about, but I won't take the time to talk about what it would mean to call it a campus, but uh, we, we need to leave some things uh, for later. Uh, th these organizations um, are very large, such as Phoenix at the one extreme, uh, but a lot of them are very small. And in fact, there are over 160 of these schools that have fewer than 100 students. Some of these schools in higher education charge a very high price, $35,000 or more. There are others that charge literally zero. And there are all sorts of in-between situations. Uh, there are very rich schools. Everybody knows about Harvard's extraordinary endowment, uh, at least as of uh, last year, uh, over $35 uh, billion. Uh, we're going to turn back to endowments later on in, in my remarks. Uh, but the vast majority of schools have between very little and nothing in endowment. And it's really important, it's what the purpose of these introductory remarks is, is to be awfully careful about generalizing about this industry. Uh, it's enormously varied. Uh, and uh, I believe, I'm going to make a little editorial remark here, that there's far, far too much attention in the popular press to things that happen at the elite schools with their gigantic endowments. These are schools which, whatever else one may think of them, educate a tiny percentage of all of the students in the country. Uh, endowments are simply not anything significant in the vast majority of schools. So you know, there are rich schools and there are poor schools. Uh, I talked about there being in a system and uh, competition occurring. Uh, Competition takes lots and lots of forms, of which I'm going to talk about a few today, but uh, only a few. Uh, they certainly compete in terms of tuition levels. I already mentioned that there are some you know, $35,000 plus tuitions, others uh, uh, at zero. In case you're wondering where, where zero, thinking about sending your kids there, uh, uh, Berea College in Kentucky charges zero, but it's really only available to uh, to children from uh, poor families. Uh, until not many years ago, Rice University, much uh, better known, uh, charged zero. They're still extremely cheap. Um, they, they compete in terms of tuition, all the universities. Uh, they also compete in terms of financial aid. I mean, we all know that the, the tuition is a list price. And uh, while some people pay it, uh, most don't. Uh, they get varying levels of uh, discounts. So the discounting policy is itself a matter of choice for the school. And I'll say a little bit about that uh, later on, because I think there's some surprising developments occurring there. Uh, the schools also compete for donations. Uh, and not only are they competing against other schools, they're really, in some important sense, competing against all sorts of other uh, nonprofit organizations. They're competing against hospitals, they're competing against museums. All, you know, we all know our Daily Mail includes all kinds of solicitations for donations. Uh, Northwestern is among those, but it's by no means uh, the only one. Moving away from tuition, the best known uh, kind of pricing element, uh, schools are increasingly competing uh, for uh, research patenting uh, and subsequent licensing. Uh, people are probably, many people are aware of the um, uh, valuable patent that, uh, that Northwestern has, for example, for the uh, drug Lyrica and the large amount of money that that uh, is, is generating. So the whole research element, uh, not so much the basic research, because you don't make money on basic research in general, but on this applied research and the patenting 
uh, is an increasingly important element.